Okay, so I'm just, if you guys are okay, it's 301, we're a minute behind. I'm gonna just get started. Perfect. Um, the topic, and I'm sure this is why you're here, it's using Canvas to support digital feedback cycles. And then just a reminder, let me click on my, this session is being recorded. And so if with my norms, um, it's the normal professional development norms, be committed, responsible, respectful, and safe. But um, I do ask you to mute your microphone. With, its, with there only being two of or three of us here right now, I'm okay if you do interject, that's fine. But you can also, um, any questions or comments you have, you can use the comment and the chat feature in Google Meet. I have two screens up. So if I'm looking over to the side, I'm also checking the chat to see if you're adding anything. So feel free to use that. Or there's so few of us here today, I'm okay if you interject as well. That's totally awesome. fine. And I do know um, a question that Sandy had, which I think is great, is where that term feedback cycle really, like the research base behind that. I'm going to look into that because um, I do talk about that, but I don't talk about where the research came from. So I do have that on my list. Um, and then as a reminder, I think you've seen this screen before. Everything we do here in Canyons is to support this multi-tiered systems of support. And specifically, when you see here that feedback cycle um, and when it comes to feedback, and I'll talk about this in a little bit when we get to the, the pages in the curriculum maps, I named it the way I did because I recognize even when we're getting eye popped, like you're required to do feedback cycles and close those cycles. And I feel like that can still be very much applicable in the digital space that we're using in Canvas. So that's what I really wanted to focus on with this. So with our learning intentions, it's how to use Canvas specifically to support digital feedback cycles. And I do think a lot of the tips I'm gonna share probably could be transferred to other digital programs you might be using. So you could also think about um, maybe what we're sharing here, even though it's Canvas specific, how it can support you maybe in other areas. And then I know I'm successful when I can identify ways in which Canvas can be used, utilized to provide digital feedback. So the agenda is listed here. I have seven ideas that I'll share. And with 30 minutes, it goes fast. I won't be able to go into too much detail or explicit, like here's how you create the rubric or it's more sharing ideas, but I'm hoping the ideas that are shared, if one or two really spark your interest, you can dive deeper and knowing that Sandy is your instructional coach, she can support you. And if Sandy needs support, I'm here to support her. So just know we can dig deeper if after this is over, you're like, I really wanna learn more about the comment library and go, and go in that route. Um, this is more just a spark ideas. That's people don't have on the cans, not possible. The ideas are just here to share what can happen. And then you can always take it to and fit your needs or what your, your style is. So I want to start out by pointing out the information that's in the instructional maps or the instructional guides. Because I think even I get stuck in this, I forget what's there and the resources available. So there's the one page of feedback between students, and it really kind of talks about what Canyons believes regarding feedback. And with this page, I always kind of look towards that critical action for educators, because really with feedback, you want to make sure you're providing timely prompts that indicate when students have done something correctly or incorrectly. And so much so even with the digital world, like if you're having kids submit something in Canvas, you want to make sure you're providing feedback when appropriate. Um, providing them the opportunity to use that feedback to continue their learning process. And then even ending that feedback cycle, because I'm so guilty of pr providing things online, providing feedback, but not circling back and closing those feedback cycles. And even like when I've been, I, I've supported IPOPs, I've, you know, learned and learned the IPOP process. And it's even hard in person in face-to-face -face classrooms to remember to close those feedback cycles. And I know it's something teachers continue to work on. And I think that's very much applicable to like, the digital world as well. And then um, I love the last bullet here, where it's create opportunities for students to give each other feedback. Camille, if you can hear me, you froze up. Hattie somehow, but I'm not, don't quote me on that yet. But these are the three different feedback cycles that our district really looks for, specifically in those IPOPs, the corrective, the expansive, and the challenge, all of which I think are applicable in something like Canvas um, when working with students. Besides Sandy's question about where feedback cycle, like the research behind that, any other questions about these two pages in the curriculum map or anything else other information I can gather and maybe provide later. Okay. 
Oh, no, I, I use these all the time. I mean, Good. I took a micro um, credential class um, as one of my requirements for my APT. And so I just wanted to jump on and see really how to apply them to Canvas. That's what I'm okay. excited about. Because, yes, the iPop is, but I wanted to see Canvas. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. So good. So feel free to ask any other clarifying questions as I go through these ideas because they are going to be very Canvas specific. So okay, awesome. So idea number one is using or utilizing the comment library. So this is a new feature. I can't remember when it came out, if it was last year or earlier or the summer this year, but it's still fairly new. And so the comment library, what it does is allows you to create and store feedback that you can then quickly use. And now initially I hear people saying, oh, I can use it for things like great work or how could I possibly know what feedback I want to use? It could even be sentence stems. Maybe you start and then you can, you can finish. Um, but it's a way, especially if you know there's commonalities or common phrases or common feedback you want to give, it's just a quick way to have that. So you'll see right here, and this is usually seen when you're in speed grader towards like right above where you can add a comment. If you see the little speech bubble, I have two that are already there that I can just quickly um, use, or you can click on that and you can add whatever you want to, to your comment library. So I haven't been told if there's a limit. Um, I can't imagine you'd ever reach the limit, but if you ever do, let me know what the limit is. But I think that's going to be a great resource because I know time becomes a big factor as well. Like I don't have time to write out all this feedback. Is there anything that you could have pre, oops, you could have pre-written um, that could support you as you're providing the feedback to your students? And then one thing you'll notice as I'm going through each of the slides, um, when it says Canvas Guide, I've been trying to provide links to everything I'm sharing. So if you want to learn more or see some of the how-tos Canvas has, that's what those are. Because I will post this to Canyon's U after as well. So rather than you trying to figure out those how-tos, I have them here if they're helpful. Okay, how is that different than the um, Canvas Betterizer? Uh, well, because the Betterizer, good question. So that for those who don't know, the Canvas Betterizer is just an add-on. It's an extension that's done through the Chrome, the Chrome browser, right? This is built right into um, Canvas. So they probably work very similar. I'll be honest, I never have done the Betterizer. I know about it. And what I've been told is they're very similar. The difference is this is built right into Canvas. So any course you go into, you have the feedback. And I know that happens as well um, when you're using the Betterizer, but then you're not limited to a specific browser. Um, so so right. ultimately this could come down to what works best for you. Um, but very, very similar. And okay. I think that's Canvas's way of saying, let's make something in-house. And I think that's great because the Betterizer is limited to five. Is that what it is? Okay. Yeah. Like I said, I haven't been told there's a limit to okay. the comment library. If you find out there is, tell okay. me. But um, I think you can definitely have more than five. But I think that was Canvas's way of saying, what can we have in-house so you don't have to use the Chrome extension? That's awesome. That's awesome. So I'm glad to hear that you were using that. I guess I heard about it last year, but then I just never actually used it. Um, so interesting. Um, I did number two is using rubrics. And I know for a lot of people using rubrics isn't something new, but when it comes to using rubrics to provide feedback, I think what some people overlook or forget about is when you're setting up the rubric, you have the you, you have different settings where you can have the different criteria where it's as specific as five, four, three, two, one, and you can click the numbers, but then you can also provide specific feedback for that specific criteria. You know, when I've been training teachers or doing online classes with teachers, I always get a little nervous that someone's going to be mad at me that I gave them a, a poor, like a three out of a five. And if I do that, I want to make sure they know why. And that's when I use those, um, the feedback options. So I can say, I'm giving you a three right now. Here's why. Here's what you can do to improve that feedback cycle, essentially, so they can at least know why. <laughs> um, or there's the option of not using the ratings and you can just add your comments in general and you can even put an overall score if you want. So even looking at the options you have for creating the rubric can provide a, diff a, a different or deeper level of feedback. And ultimately it will come down to your, your purpose. Um, but for this one, it's remembering what you can do for rubrics and they can You, when you're doing an assignment and you change the submission type to external tool, the, the add rubric button disappears. 
So if you're ever going to want to add a rubric to something like that, you want to add the rubric first and then change the submission type to um, external tool, and then you can edit it. And then I also recommend that you actually take a screenshot of the rubric because I'm a big believer in letting the students see what the rubric is because that can guide what they're creating and they can check some of an assessment capable learner, right? They can actually um, really help guide their their. I still have access to it to be able to provide that feedback and then the students can see that that graded feedback uh, rubric as well. Um, having it in the directions just makes it more in their face. But I do like using rubrics. Um, I mean, I think as a teacher, how, how long have we heard about rubrics in general? It's kind of a it's kind of a thing here. Um, idea number three is the video and audio feedback. Now, one thing that I think a lot of people know that when you're in the comment box underneath where you can type, there are the options to do a video or just audio of your feedback. Um, so that's one way to provide feedback because sometimes this could be based on students as well. If you know you have a student who does better visually or hearing something versus reading and understanding your feedback, that might be an option. Or another option is creating a screencast using something like Screencastify, Loom, or even Screencast-O-Matic. Because with these three programs, you can actually get a link to your screencast, and then you just put it into your comments and say, hey, watch this video, and um, this will give you the feedback you want. And one thing I like about screencasts is if I want to have whatever it is they submitted on the screen as I'm talking, I can really highlight and point to and be a little bit more visual with the feedback I'm giving. Um, I have two examples with, oh, I have one example with, with this specifically. Um, when I was working with, uh, oh gosh, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, one of my other um, endorsement courses, I had written a ton of feedback on something that, they, that was submitted. And after I had like added all of my feedback on these different elements of this document, I was like, oh my gosh, I worry that this person's gonna see all my feedback and freak out and think that they did everything wrong. And that wasn't the point of my feedback. My feedback was more like asking some questions, having them really relook at some of the items on there. So I actually did a screencast to kind of talk through some of my comments. So it didn't seem so overwhelming. And that the, the response I got was, thank you for the screencast because that really helped clarify some of the comments that I had put off to the side. Now, I, I recognize you don't have time to do that for every student, but it's almost like when you really feel like it would be beneficial and supportive, that's when I recommend doing it. Um, the third bullet even makes a suggestion of when making a screencast, record them in a way where you can reuse them with different students. And I don't recommend that for everything, but um, I think there was one year, it was in a Canvas course, I was recognizing that a lot of people were making the same kind of the same error and I was giving the same feedback. So I had a screencast that I could then just copy and paste every time and say, hey, here's what you need to do for this specific element, watch this screencast. And it was a how-to of me showing them what to do. So that way I didn't have to keep recreating the screencast. It was generic enough where I could write something and then say, hey, watch this. And that actually was pretty nice because by the time I got the resubmissions, I was able to look back and, and I think the video actually helped. And then thinking about the feedback cycle, I was able to close it by saying, that was awesome, great work, I see what you did. That's where me being able to go back and comment back on what the, the adjustments that they met, they made. So um, idea number four is that doc viewer in speed grader. Um, one thing to know about this, because if you've never seen this before, um, it's only available for like online submissions where it's a file upload. So it doesn't work for text entry. It doesn't work with the Google LTI. But what it allows you to do is what you're seeing on the screen where you can highlight, you can actually comment, um, you can actually annotate, you can strike through. It's a way to get a little bit more specific on documents. Um, if you're using Google, that's where you can use the Google tools. Um, you just ensure that the student adjusts their share settings that you can edit, and then you can go in and actually make some comments. But um, I have teacher app, iPad and pencil, because um, a colleague of mine was saying where he has teachers who will use the teacher app and doing these annotations using the iPad and the pencil has made it very easy. So it's kind of a slick way to provide that feedback. And that's where you can get very specific on specific documents that are being submitted. Um, but I actually really like the doc viewer, but once again, being aware of what submissions 
it will work in. Um, Cause I know text entry doesn't work. And then peer review, because if you remember on that feedback page, it talks about allowing students to provide feedback to one another. There is the peer review where you can actually enable the students to provide feedback on each other's assignments. Um, you can do it where they can see the names. So the example you're seeing, they can actually say, you can see assigned peer reviews and they can see the student's name, or you can make it um, anonymous so they don't actually see whose paper your expectations, just to ensure, I mean, some kids are really good and respectful. Others can be middle schoolers, <laughs> is that the best way to, I don't know. They can just maybe not take it as seriously or maybe they'd be disrespectful. You wanna make sure if you're doing peer reviews, you really do set the stage. Um, you may have to model a little bit of what it looks like, like best practices for it, because you wanna make sure when you're doing the peer reviews that it's supporting the student growth. It's not making it seem more, I don't know, making it more of a thing that kids start to fear because they're worried about what their peers are gonna say. Um, and then the example below, you can see with the annotation, they have those, that doc viewer, just like um, the teacher seeing, once again, thinking about the um, submission type, because the submission type still applies here for them to be able to see this. But, can um, you do peer reviews between classes? Like, can you do all 150 students or does it have to be within that second period? I believe if you have your course cross-listed, oh, that's a good question. You know what, Sarah, I'm gonna write that down and find out because I can't okay. remember if in the setting, if you can say, I wanna say you can do it among all sections, but you okay. can also, I will find out. I want to say you can, but I, I don't want to. I'll find out. Okay. That would be awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Because I think you can. I think you can also say I only want it with this specific section. But I will double check on that because I'm suddenly second guessing myself. That was a really good question. Because you can manually assign peer reviews. And you can automatically. Okay. I will follow up. And then you can see how do I view student peer review comments as an instructor. That's a good thing too as well. I really do recommend if you're doing this, you follow up as well, just to ensure that your students are following through with your expectations. They're being respectful because then you can adjust behavior or talk to whoever you need to if you find out they're not doing it appropriately. Um, idea number six is the Canvas quizzes. Um, and this is one where you don't want to go too overboard, but it is a way for you to provide some common, like some some positive feedback if they get a correct answer or if any of the possible answers here. You can do positive, you can do corrective, you can do even like the blue is like more of the neutral. But if you feel like this could be appropriate, but it's available for um, classic and new quizzes. Um, I've seen teachers use this. Also, don't need to do it for every single quiz. Otherwise, that's a lot of time adding comments, um, or it could be something that you are eventually building up to, or if you're working with other teachers, you can work together. Or if you do know there's a common question that kids miss or struggle with, maybe that's the one you focus with, or maybe you provide some helpful hints, like don't forget about this, you know. Um, I've used this, but I've also not done it on every single question in a quiz, because I recognize it takes time to add all of those. And I want it to be more than just great job, great job, great job. I like my feedback to be a little bit more specific and supportive. Um, and that's where, you, depending on the quiz, you can decide what's going to be the most appropriate. And then the last tip ultimately is no matter what you just do, teach students how to access feedback. Because I do think we assume Oh, the kids are going to know they can figure it out even how to view the the rubric sometimes it's a little tricky for students and you could even have if a student feels comfortable um you know displaying their screen and showing the kids or using the test student is probably maybe even a better option just to say here's how you're going to view the feedback here's how you access it here's what it means i think no matter what option you choose really teaching them how to access it and maybe even letting them know when I leave feedback and you respond to me, I will respond back to you. And that's why going back to the idea of the, of the feedback cycles, I know for me when I've had teachers leave feedback and maybe I ask them a question, 
I get frustrated when they don't respond to me or sometimes I get frustrated if like I do what they ask me to do and then I don't get anything back to, to confirm that yes, I did it right. Or um, I don't know, and even thinking about, even when I was taking classes up at the U, I remember submitting some papers for an assignment and I kept wanting to go back and see the feedback the teachers were giving me. And I loved the teachers who really did give me some feedback, like whether it was good, bad, or the ugly. Um, and then it was frustrating when I would just get a score and I'm like, I have no idea why I missed three points or if I met the, met the marks. So I do know, at least from my perspective as a student, that feedback is really supportive. Um, an idea that someone shared with me yesterday is make space for this in your daily routines, it's like an example of a starter. There's a teacher, I think it's at Brighton High School. I wish I could remember the name because I would totally give her a shout out right now. But this teacher actually works in part of the daily routine, I think it's part of her starter, giving students time to actually look at the feedback in class um, and either respond to it, make adjustments based on it, or the teacher's physically there to actually ask in person and get that feedback verbally. So I loved this idea of not just explicitly teaching it, but actually making space for this in class so students will take the time um, to, to look at the feedback. Because I also know when I say, oh, it's frustrating as a student not to be able to get feedback or communicate with my teacher, it's also frustrating as a teacher when I'm leaving some great, fabulous feedback and the students aren't even looking at it. So I want to make sure when I'm doing feedback, it's actually, um, it's worthwhile and really support supportive. Um, I actually cruise through that pretty, pretty quick. What questions do you have? And I know there's a few things I'm going to follow up with specifically about the peer review and the feedback cycles. With these ideas, are there other ideas that, are, that you know you've done that you want to share? Or do you have any other questions about any of the questions I've sh or the ideas I've shared so far? So my question is about, okay, the doc viewer in SpeedGrader. You can do it on an LTI because I do it all the time. But mine look different than yours. What does yours look like? Okay, can I, sh here. can I share my screen? Yeah, I'm gonna, oh my gosh, let me go back over here. I'm gonna stop presenting. Yeah, show me yours. So mine, okay, so I just pulled it up just in case I was like going crazy. I'm glad you did. Um, let's see, which one is it? So if this, for example, is a Google LTI. Oh. It's a starter that we do. And so what I do is this is like just in speed grader and see up here how I can pin it. And then I can yeah. say, Hey, like leave a comment. You didn't do this or whatever. Um, but it, mine are, mine were down here. Yours are up here, but you can also do like the highlighter. So I can go through and yeah. highlight and say, Hey, you forgot one of the elements of art. So you can do it on an LTI. Perfect. Cause I, and you know, it's funny. Cause when I, I just did an assignment via the Google LTI. Yeah. Maybe I had something set up wrong, but that's exactly the same. I mean, that works exactly the same as um, the file upload. But I do know the text entry is the biggest issue that I think people assume yes. that it will work. And I actually have issues with text. I, I like text entry for like yes. short, succinct to the point things. Cause we actually had a student, I have been a Brighton high school student who kept saying I was working on my, my text entry and she'd close her lid before submitting and then she'd go somewhere else, open it, and then submit. And that whole process, it's not auto-saving. It's not going to save oh. her text entry. So she kept thinking things were being submitted, uh, but it was blank. That's hard. And so I like text entry for some things, but not for all things. Yeah. So thank you for showing that to me because you're right. You can use it for the Google LTI. I don't know if you could use it for things like, because Nearpod, you wouldn't be able to use it for Nearpod. Mm -mm. I'm trying to think of what other LTIs people would, would try to, or Flipgrid, you couldn't use it with that. But no, I'm glad to see that it actually works. So thank you for correcting yeah, me. No problem. It's my favorite thing. I love, I love, I'm glad to hear that you're using that and it's helpful. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I love it. Yeah, I do it all the time. My okay. question is, and, and I haven't seen this used, so I don't know if there's a way to do it. In a live, real time, for instance, we're in a faculty PD. And as teachers are working on a piece of whatever we're doing, how do we? Maybe it's a conversation and we can be providing feedback. Maybe through Canvas isn't the right place to do that. 
but doing a Padlet isn't the right thing either. Will you repeat what you said? Because you you both, it might have been my, my connection because you both froze right froze. as you were. Okay. So, and this is just a brainstorm because I haven't thought this, I know what I want, but I don't know if I can do it here on this platform. So if we're in it like a faculty PD and I want the teachers to be practicing what we're talking about with, mm -hmm. you know, responding to a prompt or whatever. And then the series of teachers that are attached to that course can be providing that feedback in real time. How? So there yeah, is a way you know. I'm going to, because what you could have them do, and I'm going to pull up just a canvas real quick. Um, you could have them go into one of their courses and act as the test student. Okay. And actually just submit something as that test student. And it doesn't have to be anything major. I was going to go into a course real quick. I mean, that's one way to practice. Because I get what you're saying. is like, how do you have them practice what you're talking about? Because I'm the kind of person where you just went through everything. I now need to try some things out for it to really sink in or right. to help me. Um, I was going to go into a course. I'll just do this one. Because um, there's always the student view. So the student view, they should be able to go into whatever student, submit whatever. And I've always done this when I'm testing out course content in general. So I could actually go, and this wasn't the best course to choose, but I just wanted to show where that test student is. Uh -huh. But you can always do student view, submit whatever assignment you want. And there's always the option to reset students. So if you want to try it again on the same assignment, you can, uh -huh. re you can reset the student. Um, and so, so it goes back to blank, so you, like you didn't submit anything. But then okay. the teacher can go view the, the test student submission in SpeedGrader and actually practice um, the comment. So kind of the evil part of me wants to have a, t a like teacher pair or trio do a role play that they have to video and submit their video as part of the assignment and then would get feedback, you know, did you complete a feedback cycle, you know, and then describing the process, um, having them describe the process or some way to make it interactive because you mm -hmm. can't do it all at once in a faculty meeting. However, the groups can go out and do their recordings and submit it, but I would still want them to get feedback on what yeah. it is or what it isn't. Well, and the awesome thing about working with teachers, and it's been my experience with Alvin, that's why I'm glad Sarah was saying, no, I did this in Google LTI, it totally <laughs> works. If um, when you're talking about this or sharing these ideas, you're going to have teachers who've done at least one of these. And right. they can actually, here's what worked best for me, or here's what I've noticed. Um, basically providing some tips and tricks or even saying, here's an issue I ran into, or here's an issue I'm having, and then troubleshooting as a group. And I even remember, I think when I came to Albion for, we were about live streaming last year, I was a little terrified because I know there's some people who'd been doing it who had tried it. But what was great is people were willing to say, here's what worked for me, or here's uh -huh. what I'm worried about doing it and having other people jump in. So you're not just hearing it from someone like me who, yeah, I'm a Canvas, I, I'm very familiar with it, but teachers who've actually been doing some of this already and then recognizing that past experience, um, I think that can be valuable too. Okay. I think on our next PD, there's going to be a video assignment. I think that's the direction I want to go. <laughs> I like Sarah's face right now. She's like, what? <laughs> Sarah, you get a, you get a little preview. <laughs> well, I'd love to know hear how, how, hear how that goes. And I just came up with these ideas based on what I know what Canvas can do. And so right. if other things get brought up or other ideas, please share with me because I'm happy to know that yeah. as well. Or if something I'm recommending, you're like, eh, Camille, that actually didn't work out so well. <laughs> <laughs> I, and it's funny that peer reviews is up because I've heard good and bad about peer reviews. I've heard, and I think bad I heard over the years was more years ago when it was first a thing. Like there were some glitches with the, with the process, but I've heard it's worked better. Um, comes to some tricks doing peer reviews. That's where I fall short just because I haven't had that much experience with it, but I know I've had people do it. So um, I'd love to hear if anyone does do the peer reviews, if there's anything, hey, just warn people about this aspect of it. I'm happy to pass that on too, but cool. So one other quick question. Once 
you know, regardless of which way you decide to provide feedback, what is, how do you make it a requirement? So the student submits their work, you provide feedback, that requirement for a feedback cycle is there has to be another exchange. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you can require in Canvas so that there has to be that other submission? No, no, you're not able to, and that's the one thing, like, like comments don't get graded. So there's no way right. to make it a requirement unless if you do something in, if you do a rubric and maybe one right. of your criteria is, did we complete a feedback cycle or did you respond to your, did you review and respond to your teacher's feedback? Then the teacher could actually, that'd be one way to, um, Um, follow up and what's the word I'm looking for? Enforce. Enforce isn't the right word, but if you if you say you have to respond, but then you never actually make them respond, and there's no penalty for not responding. Right. I'm the kind of person where I, I won't. Re I'm like, they say we have to, but nothing happens when I don't. So, I'm not <laughs> so that's where it's only the expectation. So I think right. that's where you could work it into a rubric, and then um, okay. if you decided to mark a student down for that you just tell them why to say, Hey, I need you to respond to my feedback. And anyway. Okay. Yeah. Good question though. That makes sense. Good. Good. Sarah, okay. was that helpful? Cause I know you were like, I want to know specifically with canvas and I have a feeling you probably knew a lot of these things already existed. So it may not have been a ton of new information, but no, it was good. It was really good. Like I did not know about peer reviews, which I think would be fabulous. And I've just been using Betterizer and then just being stuck to those five. So knowing mm -hmm. that it's actually in Canvas. So yeah, I learned a lot from it. I think it was good. And I, I do a lot of feedback on Canvas and I learned a lot. So I think it was great. Awesome. And keep me posted if there's any questions you guys do have that come up after this and happy to answer whatever I can. And then I will follow up on those two questions about the feedback cycle and then assigning peer reviews across sections. I will verify whether or not that's actually okay. Available. I think <laughs> yeah. it is, especially if you can do it anonymously, but I will find out. Okay. Because yeah, I know when you create good. groups, you can create groups across sections. Mm. Yeah, you can. Yeah. But if you could do across sections anonymously, that would be ideal. That'd be awesome. Oh yeah. my gosh, that'd be great. Okay, I'll find out. Okay. Awesome. No, that was great. Thank you, Camille. I appreciate it. Of course. And then don't forget, if you guys want me to, I can post it in the chat. But if you want the relicensure credit, here is the form right here. I actually mm. don't have it ready for you. I'll email it to you when I email you. Normally, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have it ready to paste, and I'm not. I'm not that prepared right now. But I'll send okay. you the link for the relicensure credit, so you guys can get award it by this. We do at the end of the month. So. Okay. Sounds good. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you, well, thank you for coming. Have a You're great welcome. day, you guys. You too. Thank Bye. Bye-bye.